Yeah, so today in anatomy and physiology, 1120 at Vancouver Community College. I'm Maria Moreland, in case you've never looked at these videos before. <laughs> I'm sure that only the students look at the videos. But we are talking about taste and smell. Do you think, and you can do this with a thumbs up because I can see everybody's screen on my other screen here. Do you think that taste and smell are related? Are taste and smell related in any way? Yes, good. How much do you think of taste is actually smell? What percentage? Would you say like 60%, uh, 20%, 90%? I'm just putting up the chat so I can see your answers. 60%. Yeah, so it depends. Uh, but yeah, about 80 or 90% even is smell. Have you ever had a cold? Right, like you can't breathe at all through your nose. <laughs> and then, you know, it's, it's actually harder to taste food, right? So another word for taste, the technical term is gustation gustation. You could name your your child gustation, everybody would just call them Gus. <laughs> I'm just kidding, don't call any of your kids gustation. But that is a sensation of taste and it results from chemicals on the taste buds. So the taste buds are chemoreceptors. Here is the tongue, the anatomy of the tongue is covered in bumps. So you can feel them if you run your tongue over your teeth. Like that, you can really feel the bumps. And they are known as lingual papillae. Lingual papillae. And there's a few different kinds of bumps. A one kind of bump is called filiform. Filiform. There are no taste buds on those, but they're very good for texture. So let me ask you this. Are there any foods that you wouldn't eat because you didn't like the texture? And if there are, put them up on the chat. Any foods you would go, oh, that what a horrible texture. For me, it was avocado. Olives, okay. Okra, interesting. Good. Yeah, there are some things you just like, ugh. Uh, durian, NATO, what's NATO? Oh, the fatty parts and blood vessels and meat. Yeah, Ugh. yeah, fatty bits are, oh. Uh, fermented soybeans, oh, interesting, yeah. So fermented soybeans, oh, I see, that's what that is. Fermented soybeans are na NATO. Um, is it because they're mushy? Like bone marrow is definitely a bit mushy. Oh, and sticky. Okay. Yeah. So, so what is the purpose of being able to detect the texture of food? How can that warn you about different kinds of food? So important for texture. Um, yeah. So it could alert you to food that's gone bad. So food that's rotted is generally slimy and mushy. Uh, foliate have no taste buds. Fungiform do. So the fungiform bumps or papillae you find at the tips and the sides of the tongue, the tips and the sides. And the other kind of bump is known as a valate or a circumvallate. They're at the back of the tongue and they're about half of the taste buds are contained here. So it's valate, it's kind of a V shape there. Um, the fungiform papillae are all over. Um, so where do we taste? 
you, so you kind of always think of your tongue as being the taste master that you have. Uh, are there any parts of your oral cavity do you think are involved in taste? What else could be involved in taste? Vision. Yes, so vision is another sense that is involved in taste, absolutely. So, you know, chefs, they probably take a course that's a year long, <laughs> I'm not sure, but just to learn how to plate food, right? If you go, I had a chef uh, boyfriend once and, and he did a lot of cooking, which was awesome, <laughs> but he would never put the potatoes here and the meat here and the vegetables there which is the way I do it. <laughs> oh no, he would stack them. You know, so there are the potatoes and then the meat was just kind of leaned up against the potatoes. And then the asparagus was, was up against the potatoes that looked like little trees, you know? So yeah, vision is huge. So, um, but there are different parts of the oral cavity that are involved in taste. So we have about 4,000 or so taste buds. I'll, I'll show you what buds are in a moment. Um, they are on the tongue. Sure, we know that already. They're also on the inside of your cheeks. Inside of cheeks, have a few. Um, on the soft palate, you know, if you run your tongue sort of at the back of the top of your mouth, that's your soft palate. So you've got some, uh, some taste buds there. You've got some on your pharynx. That's the part of the throat that's responsible for swallowing and even your epiglottis. The epiglottis, which is that funny little cartilaginous structure that closes your trachea when you swallow food and closes your esophagus when you're breathing. Although it doesn't always do that which is where you will, you will cough. So let's look at the function of those different papillae, those different bumps. Uh, uh, filiform, filiform. There are no taste buds. There are tiny spikes. Have you ever felt a cat's tongue? Very spiky. Their filiform buds may be a little bit uh, taller, but because they use them for grooming. So cats use these for grooming their fur. Grooming in cats. Um, it's for us, it's very important for texture. So that's how you can tell, is something slimy or is it harder or is it, has it got a rough texture or smooth texture? Uh, the fungiform that are found at the tips and the sides of the tongue, they're called that because fungi means fungus, which is uh, like a mushroom is the fruiting body of any fungus. So they look a bit like mushrooms. Hence their name, their mushrooms. Um, and each one, each, whoopsie. Each fungiform papilla, that's singular, has three taste buds. three taste buds. Then what was the other one? Valate, valate or circumvallate. <clears throat> Those are bumps that are surrounded by a trench. Indeed, all of the buds are a little bit depressed to gather saliva with the molecules of food dissolved in the saliva. So it's very important that the molecules are dissolved. Otherwise, the taste buds wouldn't be able to um, 
find. So if you ever, you could try this one time, you could like dry, dry your tongue with a towel and then put some, some kind of food on there and so you won't be able to taste it. So valate uh, at the rear of your tongue, rear of tongue. Surrounded by a trench. Um, there are about seven to 12 valate papillae. And they contain, however, about half of the taste buds that we, that we have. Half of our taste buds. So about 250 each. So each papilla has about 250 taste buds. So let's look at taste bud structure. Was that okay to everybody get that down? I'll leave that up for a second. It turns out it doesn't matter where the taste buds are, whether they're valate, uh, valate papillae taste buds or uh, fungiform, it doesn't matter where they are. All taste buds really look alike. They all look alike. They're all kind of lemon shaped. So all taste buds, I'm just going to write this down here. All taste buds look alike. They're kind of lemon shaped. Lemon shaped. Now I look at my printing on, on there and I'm absolutely appalled. It doesn't seem to be getting any neater, but as long as you can read it, that's the important thing. And you're thinking, well, we can barely read it, but I hope you can read it okay. So lemon-shaped. Um, lemon-shaped groups of cells. So a taste bud is a group of cells. About 40 to 60. And some of those will be taste cells, but not all of them. So there'll be, there will be three kinds of cells. Some of them will be taste cells, gustation cells. Some of them are supporting cells. And some of them are basal cells, which will replace your taste cells. Uh, so taste cells, are epithelial cells. They belong to the epithelial group of cells. They synapse with sensory neurons at their base. I'll show you what all this looks like in a moment. With sensory neurons at their base. Um, so they don't live that long, really. They live about uh, seven to 10 days only. As you can imagine, you know, they're in your mouth, they're in your tongue. We're chewing food all the time. There's quite a bit of abrasion really going on there. And so they don't, they only last about seven or 10, 10 days. And then they're replaced by mitosis and the differentiation, that just means becoming a different kind of cell, differentiation of the basal cells. So the basal cells are just there to replace the taste cells that you lose every seven or 10 to 10 days. That's what they do. Uh, the support cells have no taste hairs, uh, but, but I forgot to write this down. The taste cell 
has, uh, I believe it's microvilli for taste cells. Uh, yeah, micro, has microvilli. I get these confused because the, taste, the sense of smell has cilia. <laughs> I believe the taste cell has microvilli uh, that project into a pore, a little depression. where the dissolved molecules in saliva are. All right, let's see what they look like. I'll leave my messy writing up, up there for a moment. There's our taste bud structure. So um, here is one papilla and here's another one. So those are the bumps. And here are the buds. Can you see that? Okay, I'll just make it a little bit larger. Those are all buds. So looking a little bit closer at each bud, you can see it's a bit lemon shaped there. Um, it's only showing three, three cells here, but it's quite a few cells. Um, a basal cell is shown here. And um, a taste cell, those are the longer ones. And the supporting cell. And that may just support the shape of the cells and of the taste bud. Might also provide some nutrients, but I don't know, I'm not sure. Yeah, so this is the surface of the tongue, the epithelium of the tongue. And here are all your pores. <clears throat> all right, awesome. So looking at a micrograph, you can see that the pore is here. So lots of space for saliva to flow into the pore. And then the, here's an actual taste bud here. So how does it all work? Physiology of taste is really interesting. It's very interesting, the physiology of taste, because you know there's a reason why you taste certain things. You know, there's a, a survival reason. Um, well, let's start in particular, that which we've already said, molecules in order to be tasted must be dissolved. They must be dissolved in saliva. That's a must. There are five primary sensations. Okay, what are they? Let's see them in the chat. What are five primary sensations that we can that we can taste? Five different kinds of tastes that you can distinguish. Umami, good. Salty, yes. Sweet, yes. Bitter, yes. As one more starts with an S. Spicy, I'll talk about spicy in a, in a moment. Uh, sour, yeah, so those are the five. Yeah, spicy is uh, a trigger of pain receptors, interestingly, of the trigeminal. So good, good, salty. 
why would we taste salty things? We need electrolytes. Thank you, Kayleen. Yeah, we need electrolytes like sodium, potassium. These are vital electrolytes amongst others. If you have a deficiency of these, you will get a craving for salts. So animals like deer and cows, um, often deer come to the side of roads in winter because there has been salt sprinkled on roads and they come to the road to lick the salt because they have a craving for salt. Um, some elephants in, I think it's India, they go through the woods to get to this very particular uh, muddy area that has a mineral that they require. It just, just occurs in this one place. So all the elephants migrate there and they get this mineral out of the mud. And it's a mineral that acts as a chelator, a chelator, which is something that will bind to other things. So for example, if you were to get mercury poisoning or something like that, in order to treat it, you would be given a chelator of some sort that will grab onto the mercury so that you can excrete it. If you don't, it will build up in your system, which is what happens with mercury. So yeah, yeah. Um, I have here that pregnant women will crave salt. Is that true, Jen? <laughs> well, you're making 50% more blood, so you need more salt. Yes, good. 50% more blood, that's, that's an enormous amount of blood. Yeah, so salty, mm, what else do we have? Um, sweet, what is sweet? What is the macromolecule that is sweet starts with a C? complex <laughs> yeah glucose glucose which is a carbohydrate yeah so we require carbohydrates for energy right we need it so we eat very high caloric foods What about, uh, right, sweet. I have a little note here about, about um, plants produce nectar. And the reason for that is so that it can, they can attract insects that will pollinate the plants. Sour, what do we need sour for? Citrus. We need sour because citrus tends to be sour, and that's where we get many of our uh, vitamins, in particular vitamin C. Um, bitter. Bitter is often associated with foods that have gone bad. So that alerts us to spoiled foods. Other basically toxic things too, like nicotine, for example, is bitter. Coffee is bitter. Yeah, we don't crave coffee for the bitter taste, though we crave coffee for the caffeine that gives you that lift. Um, let's see. Umami is associated with proteins. Amino acids. So we're covering a lot of our, of course, macromolecules. Um, proteins, amino acids are required for those. Vitamin C is a coenzyme. Good. Uh, vitamin C is a coenzyme. Um, Sweet, of course, we need our carbohydrates for energy. 
and we need minerals and salts for electrolytes for our nervous system, for example, requires them. Mm -hmm. I have a few more notes here. Let us add them. Oh, umami is apparently Japanese slang word for delicious. <laughs> umami, so amato sodium glutamate um, is uh, amino acid and it confers a good taste. So what else influences taste? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oops. Taste is also, also influenced by, um, somebody said vision. Yeah, what does it look like? Uh, texture, and very importantly, aroma. What about temperature? Does temperature make any difference to how you taste food, do you think? Yeah, definitely. Unless it's supposed to be cold, you don't really, you don't really like cold soup. Well, there are some that are supposed to be cold, but if it's supposed to be a hot soup and you taste it and it's cold, you're like, meh, put that in the microwave. <laughs> yeah. Appearance. What does it look like? Hmm. So many flavors depend on aroma. If you had cinnamon, for example, without smelling it, it would just be faintly sweet. Um, texture, food texture, is also known as mouthfeel. Detecting food texture is known as mouthfeel. And it is detected by Um, lingual nerve branches of the cranial nerve called the trigeminal. The trigeminal nerve. Um, and they're in uh, filiform and fungiform. Papillae. But if you have a hot pepper or a, like a habanera, uh, what are the other ones? Jalapeno. Um, I don't know. I don't really eat that much hot food, but hot peppers stimulate the uh, free nerve endings of the trigeminal. Those are pain endings. So you might wonder why Eat spicy food if it's painful. It can be very tasty too, of course. But what could we, we talked about the adaptive reasons for tasting salty, sweet, sour, bitter, and umami. We need all those for survival. Do you need to have spicy food for survival? Um, well, apparently chili peppers have like, I think it's five or eight times as much vitamin C as an orange. Yeah. So how does taste happen? Mechanisms of action or taste. Uh, there's two different ones. Uh, one is by second messenger and the other one is direct. So the direct 
direct one is um, sodium and acids. They penetrate the taste cell immediately. and depolarize it, triggering an uh, action potential in the sensory cell. They penetrate the taste cell directly. And then the taste cell releases neurotransmitters to the first order sensory neuron. However, sugars, alkaloids, those are your bitters, and glutamates bind to receptors on the taste cell and activate a second messenger system. Yeah, and I think that is all we will talk about when it comes to taste. Let's go through smell. We'll look at that, our olfactory quickly. Uh, just, it should only take about 10 minutes and then we'll pause for our first break. Oh, wait, I forgot about this one. Wait, okay, rewind. <laughs> Projection pathways. Um, this is actually pretty important too. All fibers project to the medulla. Uh, cells project to the hypothalamus and the amygdala. And they project to the thalamus and then the postcentral thalamus of the cerebrum. I don't have a, a diagram of that. So I would say uh, check text diagram. Sorry, I don't have that but it shows you quite, quite nicely where the projection pathways are. So uh, taste can also be influenced by emotion. So the, interestingly, the amygdala does get involved in taste. Uh, the hypothalamus is our homeostasis organ. So it's important that the hypothalamus can detect what we're eating. Um, the thalamus, of course, is the editor, so there are there is some habituation in taste, but not as much as there is in smell. Habituation is quite strong with smell, which is what we'll talk about now. So another word for smell is olfaction. So the technical term is olfaction. Uh, the receptor cells form what's known as an olfactory mucosa, just like any um, molecules for taste, molecules must be dissolved in order for you to smell them. Yeah, a smell is highly sensitive, uh, more so in women than men. Um, we can distinguish maybe 10,000 or more odors and you know, there was a story about someone who could smell like way more than that, but I don't remember, but it was an incredible number of different kinds of smell. But um, of course, I guess you've really only got the word of the person who's doing the smelling <laughs> as to what they're smelling. But somebody, somebody for example, who um, designs perfumes must have a very sensitive sense of smell because perfumes are very subtle. And a perfume isn't just mixing of just any old thing. Uh, perfumes have three levels. They're called notes. So there's a, a bottom note, a middle note, and a top note to perfumes. 
And uh, the bottom note is like the molecules of say a musk, that's where they come from. They come from animals that produce musk that attract members of the opposite sex. So these molecules are quite heavy. So if you put them on your skin just like that, they wouldn't evaporate. So nobody would ever smell them or they might evaporate, but, but with a lot of, a lot of uh, sweat and heat. Um, so there's a middle note and the middle note is usually something floral that will evaporate, but also takes a while to evaporate. So there's a top note that's added to perfumes that is a citrus. And citruses evaporate really readily. And so the whole, <laughs> the whole system is such that the citrus evaporates first. So if you're in a store smelling perfumes and going, oh, this smells nice or it doesn't, you're just really smelling those, that fir those first top notes. So you have to have it on your skin for a while. So the top note evaporates, but it pulls uh, the floral notes with it. So eventually you can smell the floral notes and they in turn pull the musk or the, the base notes with them. So it's a very complicated thing. And um, so we, mostly women design perfumes. If you get into being a sommelier, uh, sommelier, sommelier <laughs> and you're going to choose wines or learn how to choose wines, then you'll be called a nose. So they call people that do that a nose. <laughs> so very sensitive. So they train themselves to, to smelling things in wine by individually smelling different things like peat, for example, not a person called peat. <laughs> peat that you find in bogs, very, very particular kind of smell. Lemons, they'll, they'll like, chew lemons just on their own and different kinds of things you might find in the soil. So yeah, it's an interesting field. I once won a contest for distinguishing four different kinds of whiskey and I don't even drink alcohol. <laughs> I was at this party for Bruce Clarkson. It was his birthday that he's another instructor and we were all there and um, they had these jugs of whiskey. They didn't have the names of the whiskey on there. They were just numbered. And then, you know, you had to try them all. But they had a description of each whiskey on the side. Like, was it a honey kind of whiskey? Or was it a peat kind of whiskey or whatever? And um, just by smelling them, I distinguished all four of them. <laughs> that was funny. Uh, yeah, so that's true. When you're tasting wine, yeah, you have to spit it out. I suppose because if you taste too much wine after a while, it won't make any difference. You'll just be so tipsy that you won't, you won't even care what the wines taste like. I don't know. Okay, that was all a bit of an aside. Yeah, so here we've got the olfactory mucosa, the olfactory bulb. I'll show you that closer up in a moment. Uh, nerve fascicles. Uh, those are the fascicles that contain each one, the separate neurons for smell. And the olfactory tract contains the nerves. So the tract contains the nerves, the nerves contain the fascicles, the fascicles contain the individual neurons that interestingly with smell are very individualistic. So they are also epithelial cells. Here is, I'm, I'm sorry, this is overlapping with the words, but Here's an olfactory cell. Here are the hairs down here. They have about 20 cilia. Uh, they also are calling them hairs, but they are, of course, they're not hairs, but they're cilia. And that's where odor molecules bind. So those are the binding sites for odor molecules. There's a very thin layer of mucus. So here are our individual olfactory cells with the hairs here sticking out into your nasal passage, your nasal cavity. And here are some odor molecules that are flowing through. You're breathing in, so you're breathing them in. And it's a very humid area. There's mucus there. It's very humid in order that the molecules are dissolved. 
So this system also includes basal cells that replace. Um, they survive about 60 days. So the basal cells replace them every 60 days or so. There are also some supporting cells and the olfactory cells themselves. So odor, mo odor molecules must be volatile. That means they must evaporate and be evaporated into single molecules. Um, they bind to receptors of the cilia, the molecules. They adapt very quickly because in the bulbs themselves, uh, that is where they synapse on the neurons, the first order sensory neurons. So eventually, if there's a strong smell for a long time, they'll just not synapse anymore. They'll quit synapsing. So the bulb cells form the axons of the olfactory tracts. So those are your first order neurons, they're called bulb cells. They lead to the temporal lobe, which is where the association areas are, the amygdala and the hypothalamus. So for the same reasons as a taste projects, projection tracts go to these areas. So the amygdala, yeah, there is a modicum of emotion evolved in smell. Um, and also interestingly, in the limbic system, there is also the hippocampus, the memory area. And smell can instigate quite a long-term memory. So does anybody have a memory of smell from when they were kids? And if so, what was it of? I mean, you're all still kids, but I mean, when you were, <laughs> when you were smaller kids or even, you know, whatever, any kinds of smells that you might remember. A pulp mill in Kamloops. Oh, you know what? When you say pulp mill, I can smell that. Such a great smell. Burning wood. Oh, yeah. That, and is it a little bit emotional? Like, do you have fond memories? Ah, cooking. Oh, pasta. Yum. <laughs> Grandma. Grandma's cooking? Just grandma. <laughs> Yes, yes, grandparents, uh, older people, they, they do produce a, a distinctive kind of smell. And you know, I read about that somewhere and now I forget the details, but I believe that the smells come from uh, sebaceous glands. Yeah, you know, I forget, I forget the actual details, but there is a particular smell, it, it's not, it doesn't have to do with um, uncleanliness or lack of, of um, um, cleaning. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's just a smell. Oh, and a perfume. So she wore a perfume too. Yeah. So some people wear perfumes and you associate them with that person. Neat. So the cerebral cortex will send feedback to the bulb cells. Um, well, that way, habituation occurs, habituation. It's, it's unnecessary. To have prolonged sensation of a smell if no response is required. Yeah, so for this one, I have the projection pathways here. <laughs> So 
So the, these are the bulbs here. There's one in each hemisphere. And that is the closest part of the brain to any of the senses. So that's very, very close to the brain. Here is a tract that goes to the cortex of the temporal lobe that gives you a conscious perception of smell. What is it? It might be a sweet smell, that is one thing. Um, and it might be a rose or it might be, uh, an, uh, what's the other really smelly flower? Not an iris, is it an iris? You know, somebody, sometimes somebody gives you a flower and it's so smelly you have to put it on the balcony. <laughs> yeah, sweet peas. So good. Here is the hippocampus, also a tract going to the hippocampus for uh, the memories of smell, the amygdala, emotional responses, and even the reticular formation is involved for a visceral response. Have you ever smelled something so bad that it makes you gag? <laughs> yeah, they are that way too, to, yeah. Even bad smells will attract certain kinds of flies for pollination, absolutely, yeah. Good smells will too, those indicate nectar. Uh, but if flies prefer to eat rotting flesh, then a, a flower can smell like rotting flesh to attract that particular kind of fly. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Good. So that is all I have today about smell. So we've talked about gustation, we've talked about olfaction. They are very closely related. Um, we discussed their projections, tracts, and we find that, uh, okay, the bulb cells, let's see. Here they are somewhere. Uh, the bulb cells, so, the, so this is actually a good one to go back to. Let's just go back to here for a second because there's some, there's some other odd um, neuronal cells that are in between the actual olfactory cell, which is this one down here, that goes through the plate here, goes right through. This is the uh, plate of a bone, the ethmoid bone. So these pores are specific to let through your olfactory cell. So the other cells that occur right in the bulb itself. So the bulb cells, that's a good question. I think the bulb cells refer to, uh, what do they refer to? <coughs> I think they refer to the granule cells because those are the ones that, that go along the tract. Yeah. But these ones, the tufted cell here and the mitral cell, those are cells that, um, nope, they also go along the tract. And the mitral cells also going along the tract. I don't know what the difference is in those cells. I always assumed that those cells are independent of the tract itself. Yeah, so I'm not really sure. It could be that a bulb cell refers to all of the cells that are in the olfactory bulb. And the neurons are just called something a little bit different. The first order neurons, tufted, mitral, and granule. You know, but that's something that I will look into and I'll write it out in the chat. Thank you, that's a good question. I kind of skipped over that. That's what teachers do. They kind of skip over something that they don't know quite as well as the other subjects. <laughs> good. Yes, uh, no, olfactory cells are not the first order neuron, although they are a neuron, they're just considered uh, a receptor, a type of receptor. 
It is a neuron, but it is just a type of receptor neuron. Good, okay. Let's stop there. And